So hello again, welcome to the Ask an Ombuds uh, October webinar, lunchtime webinar. My name is Rose Spidell. I'm a senior education ombuds with our office. And today here with me is Yasin. You want to introduce Yassine, yourself? Yasin, and I'm an associate education ombuds and community engagement system. Excellent. So I am going to go ahead and share the screen so you can um, follow along there. Um, if you were registered, uh, as of 10 o'clock, you should have a copy of the PowerPoint, and we also, um, as usual, will post it on our website later, as soon as we can, along with a recording of this webinar. So again, we are um, recording, and um, we're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you to everyone who's with us already, um, and thank you to everyone who has signed in um, and shared questions. We do have quite a few. I'm going to try not to talk too quickly. But I will invite you, um, even though we have questions and answers prepared, to please don't be shy about sharing additional ones if they come up um, during the course of this webinar. To do that, we do have folks muted, which means um, you can use either the chat feature or the Q&A. All right. So quickly, uh, first, we start with a briefly uh, reviewing what is OEO. We are a small state agency under the governor's office, created by our state legislature in 2006, um, aimed at addressing educational opportunity gaps, uh, facilitating um, collaboration and partnership between families and schools, and helping to resolve disputes when they come up through a collaborative process. Yasin, you want to get me started with our first question of the day? We might as well jump right in because we've got a lot to go through. Perfect. Okay. So the first question is, did the truancy laws change again, and what is new? Yes. Well, indeed, if I um, were savvy enough with technology, I'd ask you all to raise your hands whether or not you've heard that the truancy law changed. And I say again because it changed last year, um, and it ha has indeed changed again. Um, part of this is because um, developing effective public policy in a system as complex as our public schools is a tough job. And we uh, I had a chance to participate in the annual BECA conference last week, and legislators, legislators were there, those who've been involved with this process, and they really invited people to continue talking with them because it is a process of trying to get something that the state can support in a way that's effective. So yes, truancy laws have changed again. What's new, there's a continuing um, shift to move away from um, actual court appearances and court involvement. Um, one of the tools intended to help with that shift is to increase um, the use of community truancy boards that are a partnership between school districts, uh, county courts, and communities to support kids who have um, missed a, a number of uh, days of school without excuse. So have gotten into that truancy process and instead of ending up um, in front of the judge in the courtroom, they will end up um, sitting around with uh, members of the community to help them problem solve. That other piece then is really moving it back toward the school-based problem solving. Um, the law now includes a reminder and a an, um, an, uh, prompt to say if there is a student who has been absent a number of times, doesn't have an excused absence, if this is a student with an IEP or a 504 plan, then that team should be brought together to take a look at what's going on, to try to problem solve. It's a group of people who know the student, care about them. What can they do to figure out what's behind the absences and what to do about it? The other thing is really continuing this effort to try to do positive engagement when a student is absent for any reason. So it still is focused on when there's not an excused absence, but also acknowledging that even if the absences are excused, if they add up, they can really have an impact. So what can we do to problem solve, again, between families and schools when that starts to happen? Um, and then to emphasize access to services. If a youth does end up in court, let's say that they actually have a really unstable situation outside of school and at home, some of the truancy laws have been, the changes have been intended to give courts that ability to refer kids to voluntary placement options that are still limited in our state, but our um, folks are working to increase those safe options for kids. 
still to come, like I said, a process. They still want to hear from folks. And indeed, there is right now conversation going on about whether a next step in the evolution of our state's response as a policy matter to truancy is to consider how to eliminate or reduce significantly the use of incarceration and juvenile detention in truancy cases and in other status offense cases. And that means cases where the only reason a, a youth is in court is because they're a youth, right? So if they're running away and they're um, part of an at-risk youth petition, looking at whether there's a, a way to support those youth, um, get them back in school, keep them safe, and eliminate that use of juvenile detention. What's the same throughout this? And you know, one of the things that we just heard echoed over and over at that Becca conference is that relationships are really key. Positive relationships um, between students and adults in the school setting, in the community, someone that they feel like they can trust and turn to, um, and positive relationships that form the, the foundation for open communication when something's not working. So relationships between adults and students in the school setting, and relationships between um, uh, educators and families to communicate about issues when they come up. For folks who work in schools or districts, you really might want to check out OSPI's recent bulletin if you haven't already. It kind of outlines in summary some of these changes. There's also some specific like conference at three unexcused absences instead of two. So those details, some of them are outlined in the bulletin that's linked there. All right. For the second question, it's what is OEO's position on OSPI's proposed school making discipline rules and what effort is OEO making to support public particip participation in the ongoing rulemaking process? Yeah, and thanks so much um, for the person who sent us this question about where do we stand as OEO on um, OSPI's process that they're doing right now to take public comment on a proposed rewrite of our state school discipline rules. We've been really fortunate to be able to be engaged in the conversation as they're looking at those rules, um, how to rewrite them to be consistent with the law that passed about a year ago. People know it as 1541, and it put some significant new changes in our state discipline, right? It said, really, I think for the first time, hey, we're gonna put some limits around the kind of behaviors that you can look at when you're thinking about long-term suspension and expulsion. Um, also, it continued to shorten the length of time that students can be removed. And it made really clear that if a student is gonna be removed from the school setting through suspension or expulsion, we need to make sure they aren't disconnected from education, from learning. So we gotta get them services. What's that gonna look like? These rules are aimed at flushing that out, making that a little bit more concrete. And right now is the time for folks to weigh in on this. And you know, from our role at OEO, one of the things that we've set as a strategic goal is on policy issues like this to do a couple things. One, try to get the word out as widely as we can, help people understand what's um, on the table. And what is your opportunity to really weigh in? And um, you know, how can you get engaged in that? Then once the changes are made, to try to bring those out to make sure that everybody has shared information. So right now, really, what we're trying to do is get the word out. So thank you for asking this question so we can take a moment to talk about it. I would just say hats off to OSPI. They have a page up where they've posted a link to the proposed rewrite of the rules. They have highlights of what's in there, and they have details about how to weigh in, in writing, or at one of four, four public hearings, and they have translated that summary of the highlights and the information about weighing in into 10 additional languages. Please, if you know anyone um, who is uh, primarily uh, speaks uh, Spanish or Russian or Vietnamese or Chinese or uh, Somali, take a look at those translations and share them out because this is a great opportunity for voices that maybe haven't um, really been heard yet in these policy things to be heard. And the fact that there's four, I just say four public hearings a few times because the rulemaking process is under state law and it requires, it requires just one. So they're really, they're, they're opening this up to try to get as many voices as they can 
So again, if you know of folks who have interest and, and want to weigh in, this is a great opportunity. Um, so now, uh, one of the other things I want to just say is that those are the four formal public comment um, or public hearings that OSPI is putting on. And what if you don't really have a sense of what's in those rules, you don't have time to read the proposed rewrite or um, you know, dissect the, the page there. Uh, Yasin, can you tell us where you're going to be on Thursday night this week? Yes, definitely. Well, the EOJRC, which is short for the Education Opportunity Gap Oversight and Accountability Committee, is hosting a community forum. That work group is composed of legislators and people from the community. And on October the 12th, this Thursday from 6 to 8, uh, Highline Community College is the opportunity for you to come learn about the changes and have your voice heard. Yeah, directly. absolutely. So if you want to just uh, get a sense what are people looking at with these rules? What are some of the pieces that folks might want to comment on that you might want to comment on um, and hear about that this Thursday? Great yes. chance you'll see Yasin in person. Um, so check that out. All right, our next question. And before I go into the next question, I want to acknowledge, thank you, we do have a question in the Q&A. And um, I think it relates to one that we've prepared and we're going to get to later. And now with this additional context, we'll try to respond to that additional piece to it. So thank you for asking that. If you don't mind, um, we'll kind of come to that down the line in our presentation today. Okay. Perfect. So what's next? So our third question is, what are some ideas and suggestions for promoting disability history month in our schools? Excellent. Well, and here, I don't think you can see my button yet. I'll, I'll wear it up. This is... Uh, Thanks to Open Doors for Multicultural Families, a community-based organization that works with a lot of families who have um, family members with disabilities. Mm -hmm. They gave me this lovely pin. Um, this is, October is, in our state, under our state laws, a month uh, for our public schools to recognize Disability History Month. And um, I just, first off, have to start with a thank you. A thank you to a group of um, young leaders individuals with disabilities um, about 10 years ago got together and said, you know what, it'd be nice if we learned more about disability and disability history when school. And so um, they didn't just talk about it. They started talking with folks, including um, Senator Rosemary McAuliffe, and they organized with Disability Rights Washington and went down to Olympia testified in front of the legislature, and in 2008, we got the bill that said, let's recognize Disability History Month. Um, so uh, we have pulled together a few resources here to share with you, and I would just be so thrilled to hear um, if you have examples of what's already happening or planned in your school or district, or what you might try to fit in this month, or what you might be thinking about for next year to share it out, because there's so many different ways. Um, here on the slide, you'll see um, we've linked to Disability Rights um, Washington. They've put up a curriculum called Portrait of the Whole Person. And it includes kind of as its centerpiece this opportunity to explore the lives of individuals who have um, had significant accomplishments or made a real impact and also have disabilities. But it has additional context around it. So it has some materials to talk about what is disability and what, what is the story of the disability um, civil rights movement. Um, so in this, right, so here are some suggestions and ideas, and we had a question pop up. What are schools or districts required to do for Disability Month since it's a state law? You know, this is one of those state laws where it is that schools are encouraged to, um, you know, take steps to recognize and build awareness. There's not a specific requirement I think, you know, some might say, hey, we should have something a little more concrete. We should have something that's maybe more enforceable or, or required because we want to make sure it happens. Maybe one of the blessings of this is that there's a lot of, lot of room for creativity. It does, though, mean that um, it still requires local leaders, local um, advocates to say, if you're not seeing it yet, what can we see? What can we do? And so I hope these pieces that we're linking to will help. Um, and I'm sure, again, 
uh, folks have many more and probably um, just as interesting or more. But so let's say if you're working with um, younger kids, I don't know how many of you have kids who like the Captain Underpants books. You know, my son loved them. He also loved El Defo, which is a great um, uh, kids book. Um, and there's videos of the authors of both of those books that you can take a look at. They're short. They're authors who are individuals with disabilities. And um, El Defo, in particular, is a story about a girl with disabilities. It's a, sort of her autobiography. And so it's a great um, conversation starter, I think, about um, you know, essentially understanding people as the whole complex person that they are, and also getting some insight into what it feels like to be that person with disabilities in a world that is so much still defined by um, what what we people call ableism, which is this idea that you know that, um, that kind of discriminates against the, uh, people with disabilities. So um, I'm not so eloquent on this. Other people really are. Another fun series of very short uh, videos comes out of the U.S. Department of Labor, and they did a series on what can you do? There's also a short series on um, because, and individuals talk about the support, motivation, and expectations set by individuals close to them that make it so that um, they uh, focus on their abilities as much as anybody focuses on their disabilities. Um, there's also here, I've put in some reading lists, some good starting points if you want to see if you can get a, like essentially a, a book club conversation at a school level with kids and or with adults. So on these, I would say these are kind of things that maybe could be shared with students um, in a classroom or in, a, in a, an environment at school. Um, the next slide, I really tried to also put together some stuff that's helpful, I think, certainly with students, certainly um, with, especially as kids get older. Um, the first one here is a link to the video or the documentary, Lives Worth Living. Um, really thought provoking and a, and a, a great um, history of the civil rights movement for people with disabilities and by people with disabilities. Um, and these, I think, are as much for students as they are for all of us adults who engage with students um, and engage with the public education system and thinking about um, how disability is uh, perceived and addressed within our public schools. And the first, I'll say the, the heading on this slide um, comes out of an interview that NPR did with an author who wrote the book, No Pity, People with Disabilities, Forging a New Civil Rights Movement. It was an interview about seven years ago. The author's name is Joseph Shapiro. And the person asked, they were talking about a lot of different things in the history and still the struggles with employment, but a lot of advancement, right, in understanding the experience of people with disabilities. And the interviewer asked, what was it that brought about the change? Would you say it was education that began to change people's lives or perceptions? Was it the law? Um, and the author said, no, I think it was people with disabilities. It was people that re redefined what disability was. They said, look, it's not a diagnosis. It, and our problems aren't medical. Our problems primarily are with the structures in society that create barriers and with attitudes about disability and that paint a person with disability as that disability and, and not seeing the full person. So this slide, um, I took the opportunity to feature resources that are um, ones that share perspectives directly, individuals with disabilities um, share their perspectives. Um, the It's Our Story Project has so many videos, uh, you could be watching them for the next decade. One of the ones that I put on here um, references Jennifer Keelan. After, oops, excuse me, after you watch the um, Lives Worth Living video, in that one, you see um, the Capitol crawl. And that was a famous a demonstration in 1990 when individuals with disabilities were tired of waiting for the Americans with Disabilities Act to be passed. 
So they put together a demonstration right on the Capitol steps in DC. And individuals with disabilities crawled up the steps, literally. And um, apparently some Congress people said it's a bit of an inconvenience. Well, what they showed was they literally were not um, getting access to our basic halls of democracy and power. And among those who crawled up the steps um, was a girl who was eight years old at the time. And her name is Jennifer Keelan. And there's this great uh, clip of her crawling up and she crawls up and she says, I'll be here all night if I have to. And the ADA was passed and it was signed into law. And it's this fabulous moment of celebrating the incredible persistent advocacy of people with disabilities and how they just said, we are here, we are visible, we want access. Um, we don't just want it, we, we will have access. And so it was really interesting for me in preparing for this and thinking about Disability History Month to take a look and, and check a little bit where she's at now. Because that was 1990, and I'd love to, you know, find out that, you know, with the changes of the ADA, things had really turned around, and the access was the story of her life, right? Well, there's several videos with Jennifer um, talking more about, you know, what's happened since then and her experiences, and they're not all happy stories, right? They are still a story of struggle. I struggled to um, get implementation of this act that is intended to just open the doors, right? Give basic access and civil rights. Um, and the link that I put up here, she shares why she thinks it's so critical that we all continue to build awareness of what the ADA is, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and why it matters. Um, because access is still something that people are fighting for. And before I run out of too much time, I just wanted to highlight, I also took the chance, uh, opportunity, because this is um, Latino Heritage Month as well, to highlight um, a leader um, who's really had an incredible impact and been a change maker on access to employment opportunities for individuals with disabilities, and that's Kathy Martinez. So I've linked, uh, there's a short article about her and her experience um, and her, her trajectory and a video talking about the experience and the efforts that they've been making to connect specifically with other Latinos um, with disabilities and thinking about employment opportunity. So here I do wanna make a really big plug and invite you, I think we still need more voices. We wanna hear more and, um, from individuals with disabilities and from students directly. What does it mean to you to be a student with disabilities? How do you understand inclusion? What does that feel like? And um, what's your experience? We'd love to hear those voices. And we're partnering with Disability Rights Washington and their Rooted in Rights Project to gather some video stories of youth. And hopefully then, uh, this time next year, uh, we could be talking about how you might be using those as part of curriculum and engaging with school communities. So. Boy, that was a lot. I'm just gonna check. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we do have another question. Um, and it is a good long question. I'm gonna take a moment um, to look at this question, let you sit with these links for just a moment. Um, and as I look at that, I want to share, someone shared with us a highlight too. There is a local young woman who was a student at the Washington School for the Blind who has shared her experience. If I'm right, I think that that um, experience was shared on the Rooted and Rights website. So definitely look for it there. Um, we have a YouTube link here as well that we can share out. Um, but uh, I think I remember seeing one shared by Rooted and Rights, a young woman who talked about the struggles of you know, the School for the Blind creates a setting and an opportunity for students to really be in a place where uh, they're surrounded by other students who are blind and they're, they're experiencing that, but it means that they're cut off from some of the, you know, um, different academic enrichment and opportunities that might be available in their neighborhoods, right? So it's kind of this tough choice, um, but the student definitely 
uh, tells that story much better than I can, so look for that. Um, all right, so we continue on because I'm noticing the time and I'm gonna come back to some of these questions as we get um, further along. Okay, so when a child is targeted because of his disability or racial background, what information does a parent have access to when they file a HIP complaint or a Section 544? And also, how can a parent know whether the investigation was actually happened or whether any actions were taken? Great question. So, you know, we do get a good number of questions about this process. Mm -hmm. um, a student is bullied or harassed, right? And maybe because of their disability, because of race, mm -hmm. or they, you have reason to suspect it is, you raise a concern with the school, and then, and then what happened? Um, what information will you get back? How will you know if there was an investigation um, and what the results were? There's so many different angles to this question, but I have gathered some information to share and highlight a few of issues that come up with this. So one is, first, I think it's helpful um, to remind ourselves of what the distinction is between bullying and discriminatory mm -hmm. harassment. And actually, OSPI has posted some um, kind of know your rights sheets, um, and I put the link there to the PDF, and it describes and it distinguishes between bullying and discriminatory harassment. And there probably is more to say, but essentially, you know, when there's bullying, a student or a group of students is targeting another um, in, in imbalance of power, intentionally targeting them, um, and uh, putting them down, or it can be verbally, it can be physically, it can be socially, uh, isolating them, right? And that um, can be happening um, for any reason, no particular reason. Sometimes it's the uh, unraveling of a social group that used to be close. Um, there can be different uh, scenarios, right? But with bullying, it's sort of, in a way, I would say, generic in terms of the reason why the student is targeted. Discriminatory harassment is when a student is targeted, um, and they're targeted because of their uh, characteristic or the perceived characteristic of being in a protected category. By that I mean a category that's protected by law, by anti-discrimination laws, right? So um, race, ethnicity, disability, gender, sex, sexual orientation, religion, national origin, also um, use of a, a, a support animal. So our state uh, anti-discrimination law protects people from discrimination based on those uh, characteristics or categories because of a history of discrimination, right? That's how we get our anti-discrimination laws, is that our laws acknowledge that there has been a history of discrimination against people on these bases, and we want it to stop. So if a student is being targeted verbally, again, physically, socially, because of, let's say, their disability or the way that they talk or walk associated with their disability, then it might be true to call it bullying, but also discriminatory harassment. And why distinguish? Well, this question about how do I know if there's been an investigation? What will I hear, right? In our schools, there are um, processes and policies that address bullying and harassment, right? I think our state has required that every school district have an anti harassment, intimidation, and bullying policy and procedure for many years now. Our state also now requires each district to have a policy and procedure to address discrimination complaints, all right? So how does a family know what to do? Well, our state rules, and they're in the wax, I've included them in the, in the slide here, explain that if a school district gets a complaint under the HIB procedure, harassment, intimidation, and bullying, and it might also allege a violation of a discrimination policy, it's up to the district, and usually through their civil rights compliance officer, to identify that and let the family know. Now, key thing for families here is, you know, when you are aware or become aware of a concern, share that concern with the folks at the school, the teacher, the principal, include details, include as many facts as you have them, 
If you believe it's happening because of race or ethnicity or disability, explain that and explain why you think so, so that they can look into that. Also, I think it's a great idea, even though it's on the district to kind of sort this out ultimately, inform yourself, find those policies and procedures. So HIB policies and procedures, along with non-discrimination policies and procedures, are usually under the student series of a district's policy and procedure manual. Often online, you should also be able to get them by calling the district. If you look closely at those, they're not models of, you know, clarity sometimes, I will say, <laughs> sticking my foot out there. Um, there's a lot to wade through, and sometimes it gets confusing and gets lost in the busy day-to-day -day of a school. Generally, though, understand that anybody can submit a written report around him. So if you think it's been going on and it's still going on, it hasn't been addressed, then find your district's written incident report, ask for it at the school or the district office. One of the things that happens here that I think causes a lot of confusion, the HIB procedure says, if the district gets a report, and if the report alleges unresolved, severe, or persistent harassment or bullying, then the school will investigate. So that if is big. So sometimes a report is put in and maybe the administrator looks at that and says, I see this report, it's important, we know about this, but it looks like it has been resolved. It was a one-time thing, we've addressed it. We don't have any indication that it's continued. So in that case, they may not initiate the investigation that we think of in the HIB procedure. So ask about that. The other thing that gets confusing is in that, the initial investigation in the procedure, it says the school will respond when they complete an investigation in writing or in person. So you might be looking for that written follow-up and you will have gone to a meeting and they explained it and that might have been their response in person. Also know that, and this is an area that gets quite, I think, frustrating and confusing, is that the, if they find that there has been bullying or other inappropriate conduct, they may indeed discipline the other student or the student who is alleged to be the aggressor. And they may impose some restrictions and say, okay, we need to keep you guys separate for a while, keep this student away, right? Now, in the procedure, it explains because of confidentiality requirements, the school might not be able to share the details about the disciplinary action taken against this other student unless it involves a directive that the targeted student needs to be aware of to report violations. So a real common one is families want to know why is that student going to be suspended? Are they going to get some kind of discipline? You might not get the specific answer to that question. But is that student going to be kept away from my student? Will my student see them in class? Will they see them in the hallway? You should be able to get answers to that. So you could say, you know, we are going to have additional adult supervision, but they might see each other. But if there's, you know, any further aggression, we want to hear about it. Or it might be, we are going to tell that student to stay and use a different hallway. So if your child sees them, let us know. So then you would hear some of that detail but you're not gonna hear all the detail of the discipline. I will say I pulled up an example of a non-discrimination policy, and if you thought the HIP procedure was difficult to read, there are even more kind of um, terms and things within the non-discrimination policies that can be tough to follow along with. The key is that um, they do encourage informal complaints, but there's an option for formal. Um, they want families to include specific facts, and then it references that the compliance officer, the civil rights compliance officer, is going to give the superintendent a full written report of the complaint and results of the investigation. So this means if there is going to be an investigation um, under the non-discrimination uh, procedure, ultimately you should be able to ask for and see a copy of that investigation report. Now, they may say we need to redact some of uh, the, the names of the other students or whatnot, um, but that procedure anticipates a written report. So here's some tips and you can take and um, review these two later, but essentially, if you're waiting for a written response and you don't see one, check in. 
you know, check with that first step. Is there going to be an investigation? Or are you looking at this as something that you're not seeing continue? Um, if there's going to be an investigation, find out where it's at, what it's going to involve. Um, and if it's been completed, you can ask, and some of these in this uh, third bullet point are what's reflected in the procedures themselves. Oops, excuse me. You can ask to see, did you determine that the allegations were true? Was there a violation? And what, if there was, what are you going to do to address it? So we have some questions here that are great follow-up questions. What if the district doesn't attempt to investigate or inform the parents? So if it is, and it's a discriminatory complaint, one of the things to look at is um, your options for appealing. Um, so with bullying and harassment, if it's bullying, then that process starts within the school district and the levels of appeal take you up within a school district. If you have an allegation of discrimination, including discriminatory harassment, and the district um, declines to investigate or you are not satisfied that with the results of their investigation, there is an option to appeal um, to OSPI's Equity and Civil Rights Office. So I would check out the OSPI Equity and Civil Rights page um, discrimination complaints, um, and there's information and details there about the time frames and the steps for that. There's also an option for bringing a complaint um, to the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights. You can see information about that too in this earlier slide um, in that link to the PDF that I've shared there. They have some information at the bottom about your options for formal complaints and appeals. There's a question, what if the dis disciplinary action was against staff? Can we get specific information about what's going to happen? Now, that's a great question, and I, I have to tell you, I, I don't have a very quick, um, concrete answer to that. What I can tell you is that over the years, um, there's been some litigation. Actually, it's gone through to our state Supreme Court over what kind of privacy expectation school staff should have in their personnel record, including complaints that are made against school staff, right? And some of that has resolved to say, look, if the complaints were made and they're really serious or potentially inflammatory and they're not substantiated, then we don't want to require disclosure of that. Um, so there's some guidelines around that. When can you get information about if a complaint has been made about a school staff and it has been substantiated and they are going to take some steps, what can you learn about that? Again, I don't have the quick answer. Um, it's something that you might um, investigate a little bit. I mean, naturally, I think there's this desire to say we want to have some uh, privacy around those personnel records so that we can be really frank and open. Um, on the other hand, if there's been an action and it's directly related to your child, um, you know, again, if we look back at that um, one regarding the students, let's think about what you need as a parent knowing and your child to make sure your child is going to be safe going forward. There's a follow-up. Some parents um, think about involving law enforcement in situations like this. File for a restraint order and what are our thoughts about that? I will say, I, again, and I've, I've seen this play out in a, in a few different ways, and, and sometimes what I hear is for families, if they feel like their student has been targeted for severe harassment and bullying, and if they feel like there's not been sufficient action, um, maybe on the part of the school to protect them at school, they may turn to the courts and seek a restraining order. And there's a process in the courts for that. Um, I. You know, in my, ideally, ideally these would be situations where you can really have open communication and work with the school to try to make sure, let's say even if it's not, even if they haven't had a chance to do the investigation, they haven't concluded, yes, indeed, this has happened, what can we do to reassure and make the student feel safe and be safe in the meantime? Um, because resorting, you know, going to court is like some one pointed out can be expensive if you want to seek legal representation for that. The other thing is that court may be able to put in a, a temporary order, but long term, right, there's going to be continued follow up. So it um, it's something I know some families uh, do. I think 
one of the things that happens for schools that schools have to end up thinking about is if there is a, an order, even if it's temporary, it may say that the student can't be in this school or in this setting. The district still needs to make sure they can keep engaging with their learning. So you've got that situation there. Again, I, I think issues around harassment and bullying can some of, be the, some of the most difficult and emotionally challenging and charged, right? Um, and so critical, even as that ratchets up, to try to see if we can keep the communication open, because um, if those students are going to be staying in that same school, if your child who's been targeted is going to be staying in that same school, then the very adults that you might be frustrated with if you're the parents and saying, I want you to do more, are the ones who would be needing to be the ones doing more. So how do you keep that relationship strong even as you're working through this tough situation? These are kind of situations where if you are working through it and you're finding yourself stuck, feel free to give us a call. Um, go to our website, do our online intake, and we can set up a time to talk more directly with you. Um, I apologize. We are uh, uh, moving more slowly than I thought and had hoped, and we have some great questions and follow-ups and things here. So if we don't get to all of your questions um, during the, the session today, please feel free to follow up with me afterwards. Um, so we will um, move along um, and uh, go on to the next one. But again, um, we're still going to get to some of the things that were raised in the question. And if you have questions afterwards, please feel free to follow up. OK. Excellent. So what is assistive technology and what is it appropriate to use? Yeah, assistive technology, AT. What is it? Um, so first, here, you know, I just want to take an opportunity and nice it's Disability History Month. Let's just acknowledge um, assistive technology, if you think about it really broadly, it's something I think all of us use. I mean, we're all on a webinar, right? So we're using technology in so many ways. I will just tell you that um, I have become so reliant on things like reminders. Um, ways to capture information when I'm trying to capture a lot and I want to come back to something, right? Um, at the conference last week on the Becca, right, I was watching people hold up their smartphones and take a picture of the PowerPoint because they wanted to see it later and remember it, right? Technology, assistive technology, and here I've pulled up the rules from our special ed rules, right, because it's in there, um, that it is any item, piece of equipment, or product system that's used to increase, maintain, or improve um, the capabilities, the functional capabilities, and hear from the special ed for a student eligible for special ed. Um, and uh, if you remember back on that uh, list of uh, uh, videos and things, I included one with Kathy Martinez, and I hadn't put in a short clip of an interview where she was interviewed by someone. She says, look, this silent epidemic is not going to be silent. I mean, we're, we're out there. We're using technology and social media and things like I am, instant messaging, which, by the way, she says, was developed so that deaf people could communicate. I mean, we have so many times when we need to look back and say, you know, there are tools, technologies, changes to our physical um, environment that are prompted and pushed forward by people with disabilities saying, I need access to, I want to communicate to, that all of us benefit from. So um, when you think about assistive technology for kids with disabilities, and I think this one came up from someone who said their child has ADHD and might benefit from a device that could snap pictures of the board, um, could manage homework, or reminders could pop up. I mean, just think about how many of us rely on things like that regularly. Um, and so, indeed, it may be something that's necessary for an individual child with a disability to really access their education. Um, and we'll look at this in terms of how that gets incorporated into an IEP. But let's also appreciate that it's something that school districts have determined is so helpful in some cases that some school districts and schools have policies of a laptop for every kid or you know an iPad for every student and that every student should absolutely include kids with disabilities and as you're integrating those think about how you can take advantage of their tools to make learning more effective and accessible 
So um, there you go, assistive technology, any device, but don't forget that there's assistive technology service. It's so key. I have heard more than once, um, well, so my child does have an iPad in his IEP. I'm not really sure what we're using it for. The service is so key. It includes the evaluation, including a functional evaluation of the student in their customary environment. To me, this is key, right? Because it's not just assistive technology in a general sense. It's what would assist in this learning environment that they're in. Um, it also includes purchasing and training, training for the students, training for the professionals, right? So um, if you have a child with an IEP and you're wondering, do they need assistive technology? Should they have assistive technology? It really is an individualized determination. Start with the IEP team or the evaluation team. Look at their needs, academic and functional. And one thing that I thought was a great reminder Think about whether and how assistive technology used as an accommodation could help support the student remaining in or moving toward placement in a less restrictive environment, like the general ed classroom. Like again, coming back, let's say in gen ed, information tends to move more quickly, right? But what about that idea of something that allows you to capture it and come back to it later? So would that allow them that independence? Think about, if you have a student who really struggles with handwriting and you students in a class are generally taking a lot of notes, I mean, maybe at some point we would say, okay, we'll have someone scribe for them, right? What could you use instead of scribe? Again, take pictures of the lecture notes or um, record those notes or something like that. So think about that. How could it help support independence and help support access? Maybe that it's actually needed for them to access their specially designed instruction. Think about, too, young people who are in high school, at that high school age, getting ready to transition out into the world. You're looking not only at how do they do in class, but you're going to start thinking about what kind of work environments are they going to encounter? What kind of demands in terms of a working uh, uh, expectations? Being on time, managing your own things. What about independent living? Reminding themselves about, you know, um, independent care for them, their health and other things. So, Ask all those questions. Ultimately, if an IEP team says, um, yeah, this student needs assistive technology and this is what they need, make sure it's described in the IEP. Mm -hmm. A lot of the forms have it on that page that says team considerations, right? It says, looks at assistive technology. Make sure, hey, if they're gonna be needing to learn how to use it, do they need a goal around that? Or is it in the accommodations list clearly to say this is what we're using it for and when? Um, so check your child's IEP, check the most recent evaluation. If it hasn't been looked at, you could ask that the team consider it. So talk with that team. And then here's what I'll say. What if they say, you know what, I just don't think that assistive technology is necessary. I think your student's accessing FAPE without it. So what I would say, again, let's go back to how many classrooms are integrating technology for all students, for students to say, there is a way we can access more information, we can do things efficiently, we can save time on things we used to do, we can make it so you can come back to this later, review over and over. How is technology being used generally, and can your student use that as well? And if you have teachers who aren't yet comfortable with it, maybe, maybe there's another teacher right down the hall from them who's been leading the way in integrating it, so can you connect them? So, uh, and for teachers who are the ones in there thinking about those the technology things, you know, how can you help draw those uh, connections for folks so that the usefulness of technology gets spread um, to as many people who can use it. Um, and we have one um, in terms of a, mo a note that a student was recommended um, to get a device um, and that it's just been left out of the IEP. So, you know, the, um, and a mention of, is our only tool the refusal to sign the IEP until that's included? Well, let me just take a moment here, even though we don't have much time, and say, after the initial IEP, um, as you go through this process of um, annual meetings or other meetings to review the IEP, and you're looking at a proposed update or revision to the IEP, um, a parent's signature at that point 
um, acknowledges participation in the process, it's generally not required for them to go forward. And so something is required more than simply not signing. And so what is that something? Well, a first step might be to say, um, you know, especially if you have an evaluation report, and if it was part of an um, independent educational evaluation, seeing how that's been incorporated into maybe uh, the district's evaluation or considered by the IEP team, it might need to be that you need to ask for another IEP meeting and maybe invite someone from the district and highlight this. If it says in the evaluation, this child needs a device, and that's not reflected in the IEP, that's a problem because the IEP should be reflective of the evaluation. Now, if it said that in an independent evaluation, keep in mind that school districts are required to consider those. They're not necessarily required to adopt the recommendation. So you'd still need to have that conversation with the IEP team, looking at this recommendation, looking at what we know. Do you agree this needs to be part of the IEP? If so, let's get it in there, right? So it's a process, and at the end of the day, um, you might be looking at those more formal dispute resolution options, but also mediation um, or facilitated IEP meetings. Um, and we have some more information about those in various places on our website. We'd be glad to share it with you when they come up. Um, so there's a lot of details and individual pieces. So yes, an in initial IEP, right? Those services don't start until the parent uh, signs and consents, you know. Um, and keep in mind, even if a district pays for the IEE, the result is still that they're required to consider, not necessarily adopt all of that. So sometimes, boy, I tell you, I've had conversations with teachers and I've had conversations with administrators and principals and parents and um, saying the same thing, which is that sometimes it feels like when you're calling me for ideas and I'm telling you to try doing the same thing again, you might just want to hang up on me. Um, but sometimes we got to keep circling back, you know, because, and before we get there in our circle, pause and think, okay, are there pieces of information missing? Is there a different way to approach this issue? Is there another person we can pull in, right? Um, so thinking about all that, but sometimes it's really, circling back and again and again. I wish I had something that was a, more of a quick fix, um, but as you folks on this uh, webinar probably know, it's a really, it's a process and, and when there's a whole team of people, you know, the, the bonus of that is you get all those different perspectives and um, experiences and the challenge is you get all those different perspectives and experiences and have different ideas about how to move forward and you have the pressures of the system. And so, you know, again, circling back, finding out what more information do we need? Are there people missing from the table? What can we try next? And if you try that and you really are hitting a wall, can we try outside? Can we try facilitated IEP with sound options or mediation or something like that? So um, I think we are Almost at risk of running out of time, but we're getting close. So what's our next one? Who is responsible for maintaining documents in a student's file? Okay, so I think this is someone who shared a question earlier, and this was our attempt to share some information on it. Such a great question. You know, we talk a lot about student records, and I think we kind of are familiar with the um, FERPA, the federal law um, that protects the privacy of student records, and also gives access to them, right? But there's some real concrete de details about student records that I think kind of fly under the radar until problem comes up. Um, and so educational records, right, those are generally the records um, that have information related directly to a student and are maintained by a school district. So it's pretty broad. Um, but then the specifics of what records are stored where, who has access, um, and who maintains them is something that uh, sometimes it's a, you have to dig a little deeper to find out the specific system used in your school or district. So some school districts distinguish between cumulative records, um, grades, assessment reports, um, accomplishments, those things um, that are fairly uh, regularly maintained, and then supplementary records, sometimes kept separate. Um, and sometimes those might be the report from the doctor or something like that. Some districts refer to a special ed file. A couple key things. 
If a student has an IEP, the school district is responsible for making sure everyone that has to provide services under that IEP has access to the IEP. Um, absolutely, they need to make sure it still stays confidential, but you can't limit access from people who need that in order to keep it confidential. You kind of got to do both, right? Um, so you got to make sure everybody understands that when they're accessing it, it is a confidential record, but you absolutely have to know what it's in it if you're responsible for part of it. So, you know, and sometimes, again, you, you might be asking these questions and not getting a response, but talk to your school, who keeps the records? Who is the records custodian? Someone who's responsible for maintaining it and keeping it up to date. Sometimes that's specified in a district student records policy and procedure, so you can look there. You can ask, if my child moves, which records follow them? Um, and who's responsible for that? If you're asking these questions, you're not getting a response. Um, you know, our typical thing is you start at the ground level and you move up um, each stage. Sometimes if you're dealing with um, here records, there are some formal procedures. So take a look at your school district's student records procedure. Um, and if you also take a look at the special ed rules, they do address records. They also reference us back to FERPA, the general records thing. And so again, you're going to find yourself looking at the student records procedure for your school district. Let me also just say, if you have a child um, that has an IEP and you've had, maybe that child has a mix of complex needs and, and issues and you've had folks, um, doctors or other providers, share information that's really critical to understanding the student's needs, be they educational or healthcare-wise or otherwise. If it's really critical, talk to the team about how to have that reflected in the IEP itself, whether it's in the accommodation section um, or somewhere else. But that IEP is, is key. And if it's a critical piece of information for providing appropriate supports and structure and accommodations, then we'd hope that it will be reflected there. Sometimes you won't get um, agreement that it needs to be in the IEP. And at that point, at some point, you know, if they say, you know, we just don't think so, then I know many families every year um, take time out to introduce themselves to their child's teacher, introduce their child to the teacher, and say, this is who my child is, and here's something I really want you to know. And I want you to have my phone number because in case something comes up. So there's a few different places, um, you know, and I think um, continuing to move through that and ask for a response, um, hopefully, Hopefully, eventually, um, you'll get that. Um, all right. So in the interest of time, we have just moments left. I really appreciate it. Someone asked a question about what are districts doing, right, for yeah. kids in foster care. And we have um, little time left. ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, added some really key critical protections for kids in foster care. Um, and they look a lot like the protections for kids who are experiencing homelessness yes. covered under McKinney-Vento. They're now specifically in there, specifically for kids in foster care, and the definition is kids who are under the supervision or care or placement of Ch Children's Administration stay in their school of origin if they change home placement, and districts and children's are supposed to work out plans for transportation for that, get enrolled immediately if they have to change schools, and get extra academic help. Now here's the thing, I haven't heard lately how it's working. I have run into folks who had been the McKinney-Vento liaison and now have also been asked to pick up that job of the foster care liaison, right? Because now every district is required to have someone who's identified as the foster care liaison. Their names and contact information are all up on OSPI's website under their foster youth program. But what is happening with transportation? How are districts making that work? We know it's not always simple, especially if there's a, you know, kind of a, a quick move. And you might be talking about a week. How do we keep them going back to school for a week? What's our, our gap, our fill-in for the gap there so that kids don't miss school? What about those academic supports, right? The idea is that they're categorically eligible. So even if you didn't have a program there, how are schools figuring out how to get students matched with the supports they need? And what about one of the key issues is that I understand that um, there's supposed to be triggers to notify 
if a school if a student has gotten into the foster care system the school should not be notified right or if there's something happening is that working how's that going are folks able and quickly and consistently getting in touch and knowing hey this is a youth that we um, all are going to support here so here i take that question and i'd like to turn it back around i'd love to hear from folks what's working what's challenging where could you use more information or support? And then I just want to add to this to say, you know, I, I've had the chance, thanks to um, some really great advocates and folks around the community, um, especially I met a while ago with a group of tribal kinship care navigators, and they work with uh, families in their communities to support grandparents, aunties, uncles, sisters, brothers, um, who are taking care of their relatives and that um, we refer to broadly as kinship care now some kids who live with their relatives are living there because they're placed by child welfare right um, they fall under foster care I saw a number the other day that for every child every one child who lives formally with relatives in foster care um, there's 20 who live informally with their relatives who are stepping up and taking care of them and and figuring it out without formal involvement of the child welfare system. Those kids still need to be in school, right, and need support. So what can we do in our school system to support that? I think it's helpful to remember in Washington, kids have that right to attend school in the school district where they live. Mm -hmm. Our state rules say students' residence is where the student is. Let's focus on where the student is, and they acknowledge that can be different when the, than where the parent is. Now, if the parent's there, the parent's there. That's They're engaged. But also a reminder, under FERPA and also under the special ed law, they acknowledge and they recognize that sometimes that parent person is someone other than the biological or adoptive parent. And so here you have those definitions. FERPA itself says a parent is a natural parent, a guardian, or an individual acting as a parent in the absence of one. So there you go. I have used up all your time. I am afraid there were some questions we did not fully get to. Please feel free to follow up with us, um, especially if you're struggling around issues of harassment and bullying. We know those can be tough, and we're glad to talk through and see if we can come up with some additional ideas. I just really appreciate people putting the questions in in advance and following up with questions. Um, we don't have the ability to capture all of your questions. We are recording this webinar, but we don't have the ability to capture those questions. So please um, circle back with us. Um, if you want to follow up with that, and our email is oeoinfo at gov.wa.gov. And it is time for us to sign out. So thank you very much, and um, we'll be online again next month.